So in this, our final screencast on uh, behavioral ecology, we are going to begin by looking at foraging behavior. And foraging simply refers to um, going to get food. So I'm guessing during e-learning, you forage a little bit more than usual with frequent visits to the kitchen. Um, so there's something called optimal foraging theory, which says that natural selection is going to select for foraging behaviors that optimize the benefits that is the energy in terms of calories gained by an animal, and minimize the cost, that is the energy used to find the food. So a very cool example of this, um, crows pick up these shelled mollusks called whelks, and they have to break through the shell. And so they pick them up and they fly in the air and they drop them. And um, somebody did some experimentation with whelks and figured out if we drop them from different heights, how many drops do we need to make to crack the shell? So if you drop them from a lower height, then you don't need as, or then you need a lot of drops. If you drop them from a higher height, <clears throat> then you don't need as many drops to get it to crack open. And then they calculate, well, what's the total flight time if you do a lot of drops from a small height versus few drops from a higher height and the total flight time is in green here and what you can see is that if you wanted to minimize total flight time you would want to be at about five meters that's going to get you the best bang for your buck in terms of um, getting that shell to crack with the minimum number of drops and so then after calculating that they went and checked out actual crows in the actual world and observed what height they dropped these walks at. And the crows dropped them at about 5.23 meters. In other words, they were dropping them at the opt optimum height for this. So I'm guessing the crows weren't out doing calculations to figure this out. Uh, rather, natural selection slowly favored this behavior because that helped balance the, uh, the cost, cost gain uh, balance thing. Poor sentence, anyway. Um, so other examples of foraging behavior. Um, generalists versus specialists. So generalists feed on a variety of food items, and the benefit here is that they can switch between different food sources, but the cost is that they aren't hugely efficient at getting any one item. Um, pigeons, rats, raccoons are all generalists. They can try lots of different foods, and interestingly, they all thrive in the city where there's lots of different food items. Specialists, on the other hand, feed on only one specific food item, but dang, are they good at getting calories from that. Um, if anyone ever challenges you to a competition to extract calories from bamboo at a faster rate than a panda, don't even try it, man. The panda would destroy you. Um, same with koalas and eucalyptic leaves. Eucalyptus leaves. Um, they're really good at that. The problem, though, for specialists, of course, is if habitat destruction takes out that bamboo, the panda doesn't have a whole lot of options anymore, versus, whereas these pigeons, raccoons, and other things can can switch sources. So specialists are really good at one item, but are really dependent on that one item. What about humans? What do you think? Generalists, specialists? I'm thinking generalists. Okay. Uh, side note here, interestingly, when a rat encounters a new food, they oftentimes will ingest just a little bit of it. And then if they get sick later, they learn to avoid that food. And that's how they make sure they're not accidentally ingesting something that is poisonous. What kind of learning is that? Do you remember from last screen screencast? It's associative, associated learning, associative learning. They're associating tasting that little bit of food with the later illness. Um, mating behavior is another type of behavior that we can talk about. Um, again, natural selection optimizes the behaviors that maximize fitness. You really want to click on this one, the sneaky cuttlefish. Uh, basically, there's there's female cuttlefish and there's male cuttlefish. And there's males that have different strategies. Um, there's the big buff strong male, and then there's the not so big buff male. And uh, this video is, is a good one for the underdogs and, and talks about how that, that little uh, weak male is able to manage to uh, mate um, anyway. So that's a really fascinating behavior. Check that one out. Um, Mate choice is another example of mating behavior. Um, and we talked about this in the evolution unit. Remember sexual selection? Of course you do. That is where uh, females choose their mate. Or um, And then we looked at different ways. So males can sort of advertise and display their high fitness by showing off. 
Um, they're beautiful feathers, free of parasites, and uh, hey, look at me, haven't been eaten yet. Um, or sometimes males um, can just fight. And so a lot of times we see males look different from females when sexual selection is going on because males are selected to look prettier or they develop horns and other things, larger body size that helps them fight better. Um, to go further with mate choice, the parent with the greatest parental investment is typically the one that actually chooses their mate. Um, the reason for this is it takes a lot of energy to have the young, to raise the young, and so selection is going to favor individuals that um, that are picky about their mate so that if they're going to make this big investment in raising the young, that they're ensured that they have good genes um, in that young. Great example of this is penis fencing in flatworms. Um, this little video link shows two flatworms, and flatworms, interestingly, are hermaphrodites, which means they produce, each individual produces both sperm and egg. So each can act as either the male or the female. And when they encounter each other, they will actually fence with their penises. In other words, both of them sort of want to be the male, because if they're the male, they deposit the sperm and they go on their way. If they're the female, then they're uh, tasked with you know, raising these eggs and laying these eggs, which requires more energy. And so these worms, when they encounter each other, they basically will, um, they try to stab each other with their penis to inject that sperm. And they just like stab it through the body and that's all they have to do. And so here's a little video that shows them participating in that. And now I know you're all gonna click that one. Shame on you guys, okay. <laughs> um, different mating systems evolve in different situations. So monogamy, is where one male mates with one female. And um, this is favored when the young need lots of care. So a lot of birds are monogamous. And basically this happens because males increase their fitness by sticking around and helping since the offspring probably won't survive without them, without him. Um, polygamy is where one male mates with many females. And we kind of looked at the, uh, the, uh, oh gosh, the elephant seals, uh, and that video where one male sort of wins uh, the battles and then um, has access to all the females. Polygamy is favored when parent paternal care from the father is less important. And so a lot of mammals actually are polygamous where one male will mate with many females. And that's because lactation is what provides most of the young's food and males can't provide that. Um, Parental care is actually more likely when the parent is certain that they are the actual parent. And so an example of this, um, external fertilization happens in fish and amphibians, and it's where the female lays their eggs and then the males just kind of deposit their sperm right on top of that. So in the water, that's kind of how it works. The females release eggs and the males release the sperm right on top. And so in a lot of fish, males are just as likely as females to exhibit parental care. In fish, you see, um, you know, a lot of males um, doing parental care. So this little guy that, that keeps all the young in his mouth and gathers them all up and carries them around, that's actually a father. Um, the seahorse is perhaps the most famous. Um, the eggs are actually transferred to the male seahorse and then he does the parental care. Um, so there you go. Um, internal fertilization separates the act of mating and egg laying. Um, sexual intercourse occurs and then sometime down the line, childbirth takes place. So fathers are less certain that the offspring are his own. And so with internal fertilization, which is like humans and other mammals, um, then you would see less parental care by fathers. Um, so some examples of, of this, uh, you know, parental care being kind of dependent on how certain the father is. This is a sad one. Male lions, um, when a new male lion takes over pride, he actually kills all the young. Um, because then he can be sure that all the offspring are his own. So natural selection favors this behavior because it ensures his own genes are passed on. Um, when female chimps are ovulating and capable of getting pregnant, their bottoms turn bright red and that signals men, uh, the male chimps, to want to mate. And so she mates with all the different males in the group and that means none of the males are sure who the father is and it's possible that that is protecting against um, the male's killing the offspring because it, if, if he mated with her, then maybe the offspring is his. He doesn't know, so then he's less likely to kill the young. Um, but of course, he doesn't help much with raising that young either.
Um, to close out this chapter, I want to revisit this video that we opened with, um, the death to the hornet. We sort of asked this question, well, why wouldn't cowardice evolve? Why wouldn't cowardice gene spread? So if uh, you know everyone else is rushing to battle to fight this hornet, why not hide, hang back and avoid the battle and be more likely to live another day and spread my coward genes on? Well, the answer to this is something called altruism. And altruism has been a puzzle for biologists. You know, altruism, altruism is where you basically do something nice for no gain to yourself. So in the living world, it means reducing your fitness to help another. And there's examples of this in the wild. And the question is, well, how would that evolve then? Because you'd think that evolution would, would take care of that. Don't be altruistic because it's not going to help you pass in your genes. Well, to explain this, um, we have something called inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness means that the total effect that an individual has on passing on its genes includes not only its own offspring, its own biological children, but also its close relatives who share similar genes. In other words, you know, my children have 50% of my DNA, but so does my sister. She has 50% of my DNA because she also inherited her DNA from my parents. And so um, by helping my sister, in a way, I'm actually helping my own genetic material. And then, you know, my niece and nephew, some of their uh, genes are shared with me. And so by helping them, um, then I can also increase my own fitness. So there's a nice quote. I like this guy, uh, Haldane, who he was joking, but he wrote, I would gladly lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins because you share 50% of your DNA with a sibling and one eighth of your DNA with a cousin. Um, so this is why your parents put up with all your nonsense because you have their genes and their only hope uh, evolutionarily is to, to put up with you and, and hope that you can pass those genes on when you're at least 29 years of age in a committed relationship and financially secure. So an example of this in the wild, um, uh, vervet monkeys, these have distinct warning cries. Interestingly, a different call to indicate a leopard an eagle and a snake you know if it's an eagle it's a different call that says get down if it's a snake it's a different call that says get up if it's a leopard i don't know what they do i think they're just screwed if it's a leopard but they have different calls for different things um and then the group responds so the individual that makes the warning call is drawing attention to himself or herself by making that warning call and yet still does it even though it puts them at more risk and so inclusive fitness can account for this um finally the initial example we started with bees, social insects are kind of an extreme example of altruism where female workers in uh, a beehive or ant colony, they solely um, work to help the queen and they're willing to lay down their lives for that queen. And there's a couple reasons for this. One is the queen is the only one that's fertile. So she releases a pheromone that makes the other females sterile. So their only hope for passing on their genes is through the queen. The other thing is though, that worker bees, worker ants actually share 75% of their DNA with the queen. So that's a pretty unusually high number among sexually reproducing creatures. And the reason why is social insects have what's called haplodiploidy. The males are haploid, but the females are diploid. So when the queen, produces gametes, if that gamete is not fertilized, it will just develop into a male. Only a fertilized egg, where a male joins with a female, will produce a female. So because of this, because the males are haploid, um, the worker females actually have more of more, you know, 75% of their DNA in common with the queen, which again results in these kind of extreme behaviors where they're willing to lay down their life for the good of that queen. And this is why all those, those bees were willing to give up their lives or put their lives at risk, at least, to protect the colony. That's all I got for behavioral ecology. Thank you, everybody. Hope that was interesting. Watch those video links. They're cool.